disclaimers. Number one, um, I'm having trouble remembering the names of a couple of photographers, but that's not a big deal. And um, I, I don't know the names of all the people we're dealing with, so some of them are attributions rather than actual documentation, but some are the other. So um, I'm sure that's not a, too much concern to everybody, so we'll just forge ahead. So uh, we're looking at Old Town, Casatlan, and I believe this photograph was taken in 1898. And um, it shows quite a bit of, there were, were once many, many poles down there. And at that time, many have already fallen, no doubt. But these two, which are significant to uh, this particular purpose, are that tall one, which is generally locally known, at least, as a one-legged fisherman. Although I, every time I've seen a representation of that, they'll have two legs, so go figure. <laughs> and then the other one, Oh, I must have stepped on the, the projector cord. I don't know why. Oh, the tank came out the other side. Yeah, the tank. Can I leave it on the floor? Yeah, it's okay. You're still hooked up? Anyway. And the other one is the bear on top of the mountain. And um, we're going to look at some changes that little bear. This was 1898 when John Muir was there. We've heard mention of his visit to Wrangell. And he made a sketch of that. And it, in 1879, it looked like that, I mean, in, in terms of the decay and whatnot. So there, it got to the point, anytime you have a horizontal figure rather than a vertical one on a carving like this, the horizontal one cracks, water gets in, it saturates down to the center of the piece and doesn't ever get a chance to dry out. And so things start decaying and then you get growth on it and so on. So this picture was taken in, I believe, 1909. And we can barely see the bear anymore. And the other one, the one like a fisherman, is tilting and the various mortuary cavities in its back are sprouting growth, as well as on top of the head. Uh, I'll also point out that from the carving down, there's the two ropes, because there's a more modern version of this out there, with four salmon on, e oops, on each side. Boom, 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 boom. And half of that is in the museum now. It was retrieved after it had already fallen on the ground the side that was down was shot, and there's a tag on it that mentions all this, and a teacher from here in the, uh, and his class uh, cut that part loose. It's, it's just a thin shell of the pole itself, the inside having rotted completely. And so they brought that back, and they painted it all up, and they recarved the tails of the fish that are uh, not how they originally looked. But the rest of it is, although it's coated with paint several times, it, uh, it is the original two-dimensional design on those fish, which is really great. Because uh, to me, it confirms, for one thing, that it was, in fact, Tajestu uh, Ach that carved that pole. So, there's a later photographer. That's this is the blow up of the of the later one, and then um, too bad we don't get a preview. Eh? Why is there two of those? So the last time I was down there, it looked like this, and I, I gather from talking to people that it, that's not even up anymore. It's already, but that vertical part, and then you can see this little mass of something that was the bear up there. So uh, looking at the face of that, um, particularly the top one, we'll see that structure again. And this had abalone shell in the eyes 
had the beak is added on, of course. The wings that were added on, you can see one of them on the far side, the tip of it is longer, but both of those have broken off. And um, there's just a lot of surface growth going on everywhere. Now, and this is one of the four house posts from the Hutgu Hit, the Sheikh's house. And you can see that they were originally down at, at Kasatlan, they were originally down in the ground. They were the physically supporting house posts, where in, in many other Tlingit houses, and maybe just later ones, because this was, this was all before 1830. And, um, so they were standing down there, and they were left standing down there uh, in 1830, and the house was dismantled. Probably the roof boards, the wall boards were all taken out and used for temporary buildings up here in Wrangell Harbor, which became Kachkhan Apu. And uh, so this is the most proof of that I've, I've seen. So they've been, where they're at now, they've been cut off a couple of feet or whatever below the feet of that shaman figure. And you can see that even at that, you can see it's rotten down there where the ground level was because that's where it retains moisture from the grass and whatnot, shrubberies. And it spent some time face down on the ground, I think, which is why that center section has so much decay in it. And you look at these outside in the lobby there, and you can see like just the, uh, I wish I had a pointer. Anybody got a long stick? I only have this little tiny stick. <laughs> but this side of the frog is pretty well attacked. And that little bit of the bear is pretty well attacked. And then this frog had the base of the whole thing became the top here. That's another um, dog. So that, that's why they're in such poor physical condition. So the two with the dogfish on them, Khatgu Hit Dogfish House, the one here in the left, the structure of those raised faces on the back of the dogfish, which were the dorsal fins, the noses of those faces formed the dorsal fins of the dogfish. And uh, they, they all had abalone shell in the eyes. And though the, the shallow ones on the other side were probably carved first, is my guess. And then when he got to the other one, he decided to give them more dimensionality. And so those two faces, particularly the lower one, is really pretty much the face that was in a somewhat flatter form. It's pretty much the structure of the face that was on that standing one leg fisherman pole. So that and the, the flat design on the um, salmon is, is what indicate to me that that pole was carved by this same carver. And um, when I was, when we were here in the 80s, middle 80s, meaning me, Wayne Price, and Will Burkhart, I had asked Herb Bradley if anybody knew who carved those poles? And he said, no, nobody knows. And then um, uh, Lynn Wallen was back at the um, museum in Pennsylvania. And at that time, in literally a shoebox, they had a whole bunch of papers from Lewis Shotridge. And one of them uh, described the leader of the Tlaquan whale house, or his representatives, coming down to Wrangell to get this carver to go back up to carve the house post for the whale house. And he gave his name as Kudges to Acht. And so that's the only reason we know the name. So again, you can see the amount, hey, a stick. Long 
So there's a closer up of the, the decay on that. And we were able to interpret that. And so that's what it once looked like. So those, the old ones are out in the lobby. The other ones are in the Sheikh's house. So we got plenty of opportunity to look at those. So what about other things this guy made? And it seems to have gone pretty far afield. So this is uh, Taquan, now Metlakatla, on Annette Island. And when they got there in 1887, I believe it was, from old Metlakatla, British Columbia, uh, this pole was still standing there. You can see it's braced up at the bottom. So, And obviously, the top figure is already in the total overgrown stage. So it had been there a long time, uh, probably going on 100 years to get that much decay on it. And so uh, they didn't, the Duncan and them didn't want it, so uh, they gave it to Sheldon Jackson, and they cut off the head of the top figure. So you can see there's just the arms and legs of that top figure. And then there's a frog coming down the chest and this uh, kind of typical attitude of a crouched uh, clan leader. And the bottom figure, I think somebody else carved that. I think this was a combination because it doesn't match the style at all. But if we look at this view of it in the Sheldon Jackson Museum, we can see some similarities with the faces on yet there's enough in it to really connect it directly with the rest of his work. And this is a village of uh, Old Kassan over on the other, well, the, it's at the east side, northeast side of Prince of Wales. And this was in maybe 1880, 1890. And there's all these Haida poles that were, that were put up since the Haidas arrived. And there's this one that's clearly older than all the others. It's been there a long time. It used to have a clan hat with rings on top of it, and that's all weathered away, and so on. So that's been there at this time, maybe close to 100 years. In fact, if you compare these Haida poles, the ones that were saved and taken to Ketchikan in 1970, and they show the, so they've kept standing here for another 100 years, or nearly so, 90 anyway. And in that time, they accumulated a certain level of decay, and that's actually exceeded by this one. So I think that uh, this, this has probably been there. It's one of the ways I date this work and this man's work to... Uh, the 17, somewhere between 1775 and 1800. Uh, and you know, that's a lot of years and he carved a lot of stuff. So here's that same pole, you can see that profile, the big ears, the, the nature of the eye socket and so on, the gun compositionally, the critter on his chest, and then um, the hat used to have, you can see there's little feet here on the edge of the rim so there's probably a figure there and the whole hat's gone and so on. Then farther down, there's the, the man standing his feet and he's wearing an apron. These are fringes from the apron, leather apron. And uh, this is the front feet and the back feet of that wolf or whatever it is. And on that apron is this beautiful U shape here that we'll see again. 
In fact, uh, well, and then this lovely face down here, the small face in profile, also gives indication of his style. And uh, that became an important one. We had to replace a similar sized face on one of the houseboats, and we used that as a guide. Barry Harum gave a talk one time, and he said, I used my face as the guide. <laughs> and I should have used that one, he said. Well, the fact was, I did use that one. I wouldn't put my face on a totem pole. So uh, this is uh, one of the pectoral fins of the dogfish with the uh, octopus that's next to it, the tentacles hanging down. and. Um, so it's got his style of flat design here on this, on this pectoral fin, and the proportions of this U shape are quite similar to the one that's on that apron. And then, so here's, this is the only time, this is when the Sheikh's house was being remodeled, and this is the only time they were all in one place like that. So that, that was an interesting thing. But if we look at, at this face in profile, that we were just looking at, meaning, whoop, one more, this one. So it's a very similar construction of the profile and whatnot. So still going by not only attributions, uh, native attributions, but also stylistic uh, traits in order to get a feel for this man's style and be able to uh, interpret other things. So then this is the four house posts that are in Tlaquan. And you can see a lot of things, both uh, your style of carving and composition. So the, the composition of that is, is almost like what we're looking for, but it's <coughs> also have the, the confirmation through Shotridge originally. And he, he got this little narrative from uh, the Hitsati at the uh, whale house at the time, around maybe 1917, that uh, of the story of coming down and picking up Kajistu Akh and going back to Klakwan to carve these houseboats. So it's, it's all connected. And here's, there's again that very strong profile on the woodworm woman and the figure Gunakadate with the whale tail in its mouth. And so we're going back now to Casatlan. Um, and in the background of one of those pictures, I forgot to mention, but you could see this pole and it was leaning over pretty seriously way in the background. But this one, I think, um, is also his work. And it, it stood down there until it fell over and rotted away. But the, the style of the face, and the, this has, again, abalone shell in the eyes, which stylistically doesn't mean anything except that it's consistent with those others. And standing on a box with a design on it, and I don't know if anything at all was on the lower part of the pole, but uh, particularly in this area, it seems like a lot of the earliest carvings were this way, a, a bare shaft with a figure at the top. In some cases, way up figure at the top. And of course, the whole idea was to elevate the clan crests. Same reason churches have steeples on them, you know, to get that cross up there where people can see it. And uh, so these were made that way. And then Bill Holm, and I think it was 1972, uh, made a copy. Am I not being heard very well? 
made a copy of um, that pole. This is when it was standing outside the old Burke Museum. And I don't know where they have it now because I haven't been in the new one in after how many years. But so with the complete hat and the, he actually interpreted from a clearer photograph the design on that box so that um, this is close to what was actually there, the side he made up over here, but it had opercula inlay like that as well as the abalone in the eyes. And that's a pretty de decent copy of that pole. Well, this is another one that was down there at Casitlan, And it, like the others, rotted away down there. But it, it's interesting to look at it. That, that seems to be the entire pole. I think that top figure was the top figure. But you can see some decay on it up there, which is always what goes first the end grain where the water soaks in. And then you get, you know, spores and whatever else, you get moss and you get trees eventually. So there's that figure and it had long wings and in, on its front was another figure. And then there's this uh, humanoid bird down here that probably had an added on beak that's now missing, folded wings and feet. And then close to it is another uh, and the whole thing's elevated on this bare shaft, right, even though it's rather short. And behind it is another pole, very decayed. All we can see is the front of a box that might have been more complete at one time, and a, and a set of knees and feet. The rest of the whole figure is gone. But we're going to see that composition again later. So we saw this photograph earlier in... Uh, Richard's presentation. This is uh, downtown Wrangell in 1868. And uh, so this, the beach in front of those houses is now Front Street. And so there was a standing pole, long bear shaft with an eagle on it, and another one with a flying raven on it. And these are all traditional style houses, split planks and so on. and. These, this was the Edward Mybridge photograph. And Richard didn't mention it directly, but he was the guy that did the motion study of the horse running to prove that at some point all four hoofs were off the ground. And then he did a lot of other motion studies as well. But he also went around and took these early photographs. So based on the fact that you know, he gathered people around and Oh, just, just for comparison, by the way, this is Seattle in 1866. So, and all those logs and that, that's from Yesler's sawmill, which is to the right, just out of the picture. But there's almost as many houses at that time in Wrangell. And Mr. Muir also drew these uh, figures. He drew the eagle on top of the pole, and he drew another bear with the feet going up up the mountain, and it had faces in the ears. How'd we get to that already? We should be here first. Somehow slide out of order, no big deal. So here's, this is the same 1868, a Mybridge photograph. And I have come to the conclusion that this must have been the shakes of the day. This, I'm going to presume, is the guy who carved that bear. I mean, they're just standing there, but Mybridge seems to have posed people deliberately, and he might have gone that far. So, and then there's the other pole that is standing there. It's ob The bear is obviously brand new. I doubt if that's five years old. So if that's 1868, it was carved sometime in the early 1860s. And next to it is this crouching chief figure wearing a double whale hat with fins, dorsal fins sticking up and a stack of hat rings. It's got abalone shell in the eyes and abalone in the teeth. And he's sitting on two rounded bands. Now, it's got a whole lot of weathering on it. So it hasn't been there 
Well, it was been somewhere a lot longer than that bear's been standing there. So my think is that that was, they went down to Old Town, cut that pole down, easier said than done, but, and cut it off, brought it up here, and now it's, and of course the, the soil out there on the island is only like three feet deep, no matter what. I remember when we re-erected re these, that was the case. So it's, it's, they cut it off already. They didn't want to go too deep in the ground. They went as far as they could feel good about it and then braced up the rest of it. And so it's got the very straight looking double wheels and that, and I've, I've heard people refer to that as a Gona Cadet because there's two wheels and there's a story about Gona Cadet and all that. But there's also a double whale hat which is what those represent. So uh, this is 1868. We heard the description of the Rango bombardment in 1869. Even the uh, government uh, record of the event uh, that he mentioned says that the Sheikh's house was damaged by the cannon fire. And I think that Excuse me. I think that one of those cannonballs probably hit that pole and blew it to smithereens because we never see it again. There's, a, there's at least one picture where the only thing standing in front of the house there is the bear. Now, the, the, here the, uh, the Nanya'i clan house, we we'll call it the Sheikh's house, uh, unlike some of the others in the village at the same time, has milled lumber on the front. And eventually some of those other houses over on Front Street uh, also got milled lumber on the front. But at this point, there's no windows. So here's another view of that hat. This is in the American Museum of Natural History. And honestly, I don't remember if somebody clued me that that was there or when I was there with the collections person cruising through their collection, which they don't let you do anymore. Uh, I might have found it there. So, so let's go back to the other picture, oops, the other picture of it for a second. And so this was the state that it was in when I first saw it. So there's this little piece here, because uh, this side had a, you can see it's all hollowed out between the shape of the hat and the whales themselves to make it lighter. So that's all hollowed out up under the, this part of the whale and all the way out into the head. And in addition to coming from here through the pectoral fin holes, the, underneath the jaw was also open and hollowed out. And then a, a little piece like this is inlet in the bottom of the jaw to close it up. And I, when I first saw it, that little piece was missing and these were missing. So I asked the collections guy, like a lot of museums do have, if they had a spare parts drawer. And he said, yeah, we got one of those. <laughs> so we went elsewhere in the, in the collections room, opened the drawer, and I was expecting to find the pectoral fins and the dorsal fins and the hat rings, but all we found was this little piece. So it had been separated from the hat at that time. And so then we brought it back and confirmed that that's where it came from. And, and now they keep the two together. There's another view of the hat with, of course, it's Emmons collection number written right on the front. So you can't miss it. I like the ones in the Smithsonian that right on the front of a chest says collected by J.J. McLean, blah, 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 blah. Old museum standards. Anyway, so there was also this pipe and there's at least one picture showing, uh, I believe it was uh, Kudanek, Shakes the eye. I'm sorry I didn't learn which number he was. But he's shown holding this pipe. And um, it's about yay long. Um, and it's clearly a representation of that figure, that double whale hat. So we got the dorsal fins, got a piece of musket barrel that's the bowl of the pipe. Uh, one end has the uh, place for the stem to go in. And then um, 
ab rich abalone inlay. And on the bottom of it, you can just see there's a something sticking down, and that's the rim of the hat. So again, it's confirming that that was a double hat, double whale hat. And the, when they um, acquired the name Hui Shix, it came from the Kitkatla Simsians who had come to try to take over the Stikin River. And they were defeated in a battle there. And uh, as a result, they had to give up you know, things of value to, um, to the, the winners of the battle, which was the Wrangell Clinkets. And so they gave up the name uh, Wee Shakes, and uh, probably this hat at the same time. Uh, probably intact, I, don't, I have no idea, but uh, we never did find the other pieces. But this is in a Kosimshan style. I think this is in Santa Barbara Museum. And it occurs to me that that might be their replacement of the hat that they gave up. And they made it more compact. So it was, I imagine that would be a pretty, I mean, that double whale hat is like that long. And even hollowed out, even hollowed out the way it is, that would be a pretty heavy, awkward thing to wear. So they uh, reduced it to that. And locally, which says something about how long ago it was, um, I believe it was Kajistu Ocht who created this hat. Here's a little better photograph of it. We've, people are familiar because that hat's been here in recent, fairly recent years. Uh, it's not here now, is it? They successfully repatriated it yet? No. Pretty incredible thing, great. And, uh, and so here's just the one whale, not the double, but uh, really fantastic work. The the uh, grooving on the rim imitates the uh, some of the weaving patterns in a spruce root hat. And then there's the the little four hat rings, and then the dorsal fin attached at the top, and the th thread there to keep it from falling over too far, and it'll. It moves a lot when that's being worn. But the characteristics of th that hat and the style of the, the work, in, in not only the sculpture, and now it's also got that ovoid laid across the snout. Whoops, happens to be co copper, Scott, pardon me, in this case. But also this uh, two-dimensional design, AKA flat design, also has a lot of characteristics that appear in known works by this artist. So that even the, um, uh, you can find flat design elements on the Sheikh's house posts that can match some of the ones on here, as well as this rich sculptural style where here the eye is almost straight up and down, maybe even leaning out a little bit. And the eye socket is tilted back following the, the shape of the whale's head. And there's that little rim, the snout of the whale comes down and then turns out right as it gets to the lip. And that, I don't know if that's just a stikine thing or what, but it's pretty common in this area for a whale. Now, uh, so here's more of it going on, and we can see the characteristics of that head more clearly. And um, we also want to look at, here's the tail, of course, coming up. And those almost round ovoids with the very high floating inner ovoid, so there's a lot of space between the fine line around the inner ovoid and the inner lobe itself on the bottom and not as much on the top. Uh, and that's, that's a lot of, that's this non-concentric thing that is present in all of the Northwest Coast form line art. Uh, and, and he used, some artists use it, some don't, but he used it uh, to, to good effect. 
And the little guy in the dorsal fin, since we know with some confidence that Kajusti Ocht made this hat, we can this look at this little guy in the dorsal fin and we'll see him in some other places like this hat, which uh, belongs to uh, people in Huna. And um, it's got some, it's got those almost round ovoids. It's got some other uh, characteristics of Kajusti Ocht style as well as this little guy, and not just the fact that there's a little guy there, but the way it's carved um, on the dorsal fin and the, the structure of the face and whatnot. So we can connect this stylistically with that other hat. And then here's Harry Marvin of Huna, who was the caretaker of that hat for many years before he passed when he was wearing it at some occasion. And I've got probably way too many examples of other things this guy made, but I'll, so we're going to have to zip through them to make it through everything. But uh, so there's that little guy again in the ears of uh, a headpiece that's referred to as the raven at the head of the nas. And if we look at the way the eyebrow comes up, curves down, and becomes a form line that in that encloses the lower jaw. And that's an interesting characteristic. And um, the little guy with the flat hands and all that. And abalone in the eyes. And in the eyes of that, there's little birds engraved into the abalone shell itself. That's a great thing. And this mask, which uh, when I first heard about it, Alan Wardwell, the who since passed away, uh, showed me a picture of it and said he knew the people in New York that had it. It's also, I think, it went to auction at Sotheby's at one time or one of those auction places and brought a whole lot of money, but I don't remember where it ended up. But uh, characteristic-wise, there's our same little guy and the structure of his face in the ears and the shape of this eye with a round, uh, iris, or yeah, I guess you'd call it the iris, and uh, very short points with almost no recurve on the bottom, none on the top. By recurve, I mean you know where the eyelids are pinched and then drawn out in a lot of cases, but that's not so here. Just the tiniest little bit of recurve at the end, and right up next to the bridge of the nose. But the nature of that nose, the, the nostril, the rounded lips, so they're, they're very curved, they're not flat. And the way the forehead comes down, like that was a painted form line at one time, comes down and boom, across to enclose the lower jaw. So it's got a lot of characteristics that, to my eye, match it up with his work, but that's just an attribution. And this little frontlet from the National Museum of the American Indian also has some of those characteristics. Uh, there's the same sort of form line coming around and a little person between the ears and that person's hands protrude through the ears, which is not original to this person's work, but it's um, interesting to see it. And this uh, spectacular frontlet that if I remember right is in the University of Pennsylvania Museum. I think it's his work um, based on the, the, the way this whale's head split out to each side is constructed. The whale's body and the whale's tail are here below the chin of this, call it a thunderbird, thunderbird carrying a whale, common um, representation. But there are the shapes of the eyes, the rounded lips, the little frog coming out between the ears, its little feet, and so on. There's just, just a lot of things about this that suggest to me it's the same person's work. And there's this spectacular oyster catcher rattle. And not only do some of the faces uh, really indicate his work, but also the two-dimensional design on the belly. Oh, the, 
it, the two U shapes that come together, the outside corners of the U shapes are round, the inside corners are square, just square corners. And he's not the only person to do that, but he did it with a lot of consistency. And even the purport, excuse me, the purport, wait, 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 the proportion, proportion of this U shape, and you know, it's a little thing, but, but people who draw this stuff, they tend to gravitate towards certain proportions and all that, and they get repeated all the time in their work. And so just there's a lot, it's asymmetrical, which is really unusual for any rattle. There's this row of, I don't know what they are, uh, suckling on something there, and then on the other side, the, the little bird coming out between the ears is a lot like uh, the ones in the head of the octopus, octopi on the Sheikh's house boat, holding on to the ears, and then the, there's the wolf on the other side with a, grasping a fish that's in the mouth of that main critter, which has a lot of his carving characteristics, and the tail, which as you can see in, in, whoops, in this picture, is completely free. I mean, how did that even survive? And um, anyway, this, the greatest oyster catcher rattle I ever saw. And another one I think is his, based on the, the work in this, this part of it, and the frog to a certain extent. Prob I, I'm thinking that little bird, based on the eyes in particular, and the use of not only a crescent, but and a little circle in the form line element, and the proportions of the inner ovoid uh, how much it floats up and all that sort of stuff matches with other examples of his work. And this bowl, which is spectacular in itself, just the fact that it's a bowl about that big, carved out of spruce, that, uh, I mean, just imagine making that, and then carving all that flat design on the outside. I think it represents a dragonfly. So this is the head of the dragonfly. This is the little face that you always see, look at the front of the dragonfly, there's a little face there. And that's always repeated in Northwest Coast examples of dragonfly. So those are the, the wings uh, coming back along the top and the feet. And it Im implies um, well, everything about the, the critter. So the feet are curled up and everything about that sort of screams his style. And this little, uh, this little uh, paintbrush holder, which is in the American Museum of Natural History in New York, it's about that big. And there's, I mean, there's not there are a lot of things you can point at, but I, th I think that was, <laughs> I think that was his paintbrush box. So, um, if we can think back to the bear, I know it's a long way back now, in the 1868 photograph in front of the Sheikh's house, and we looked at the structure of that bear's head, um, it's almost exactly the same as this. It's got the same faces in the ears, and very V-shaped, no curvature, lips, curved across the front, and other characteristics make it really apparent that the guy who carved that bear, the new bear, in front of the Sheikh's house, also carved this. So this was a grave house. I'm not sure where in the harbor. Uh, maybe Tsiknakari country, bear. Would that make sense? And uh, it's obviously come apart and all that. And as far as I know, the whole thing right away. But, this is, and it might have been that guy who, standing next to Shakes who carved it. No idea of a name. It might not have been, but he, he made several things. I think he made this bear, the CCC copy of which is standing at the back corner of the Shakes house. And the, the structure of that is just so, and proportions of the face are so much like both of those other bears that I think that's his, that guy's work. I'm gonna call him the bear carver. And um, 
So here's other, this is the cor back, back corner of the shake. I'm pointing on the screen, what an idiot. Uh, and so that's there, and then there were other houses out there at the time, and this other pole. And there's a copy of it on the, on the kind of the south end of the island there. And it's identified as a strongman pole, and we're, we're going to see more of that. But in this photograph, it's facing west. And then, so here we're back in front of the Sheikh's house. There's the new uh, double whale hat the pole that's going to that replace the one that got shattered in 1868. Or probably did, and the, the bear, the paint's worn off the feet, and the head's starting to go. So it's clearly at this point older than this pole. And this is a different artist, and we're going to talk about him later. And then there's the bear on the front of the house. Now, did the bear carver make this? I don't know. I, I kind of think he might have. So there's the original screen in the Denver Art Museum. Great thing. And in 2013, when, uh, a group of us worked on a copy of this. The only thing we changed was I thought that hole was a little bit too small for people to walk into the Sheikh's house. I know I couldn't fit. So we made that hole about twice as tall as that and wider and then shrank all that other stuff so it would fit. But it, if you didn't really look at just the hole and realize how different they were, it came out pretty decent. And then next to it is a little fragment of the, another example of the, what appears to be the same screen. That's the hand, the elbow down there. So it's, it's this section right here. Well, technically, yeah, this one. And it's just that much, and you can just see the edge of this form line up there at the top. That's in the Burke. And so I don't, I don't recall what they have in the way of collection information on it, but apparently there was another bear screen and uh, down at Casatlan. And that's a, a, a one surviving fra fragment of it. And so here they are in the house. The, dogfish posts and the bear screen and the ears were made detachable. There's little bolts to hold them on so that it still extended above the roof line, actually more than that implies. Uh, and yet it would also fit in the house. So it's very uh, thoughtfully constructed. So then uh, I, I don't know at all who carved these. It, it was said that it was a, a Haida carver, and maybe more than one. And we know that the pool on the left, in terms of the figures and the composition of it, is a copy of a staff, a speaker's staff, that uh, was given to the Kadashan family. And so, and that is in the Museum of American Indian, New York. Uh, is that the old American? It's in the little fragment of the, when they moved the Museum of American Indian to Smithsonian from New York, part of the deal was they had to keep some of the collection in New York. So down in the old customs house, the south end of Manhattan Island, there's this installation from the Museum of American Indian. And uh, that the, the staff that that pole is copied from is there. You can go see it, and it, it's just like that. And the other one, uh, I don't know about the composition of it, and it was said to have been made by Haida. But we can see some of the same pieces. This is another Mybridge photo in 1868. And there's, a, obviously, at that point, a house behind it of traditional construction that is coming apart even at that point. And then through time, they changed. So back here, there's still a lot of paint on them. We can see the eyes, the eyebrows, and all that. So they're, they're, they're probably could be 10, 15 years old at that point, but we, we don't see any growth on it. And then this is much later, a different house back there. 
and a lot more weathering and whatnot going on. The beach is just still right there. And so this was, uh, I think eventually, they got to looking like this, and then a retaining wall was built so the tide didn't wash up on the bottom of the poles. And they're obviously getting a lot older. And then the spectacular two-story Victorian house was built behind them. And then I suspect it had something to do with the lumber mill coming in. And it's in this place, and they, they just moved everybody to get out, you know, took over. That's my guess. Because uh, none of that stuff survived. And in fact, those poles were moved over and they stood for a while, those originals, in the lot where uh, the transfer company is right now on Front Street. Yeah, where AML is, in that lot, just south of the Kicksuddy pole. And they stood there for a while. I've seen a picture of them standing there. And then they were uh, incorporated into the CCC copy program. So, um, so we can see what it says. Partridge, I think he was here in 1898. That can, that's one of those facts that is slipping my mind. But uh, Wrangell, there's a nice little spruce canoe down there among the rocks. And the, the town at that point and the fort that we heard so much about earlier there. So this has commonly been called the keat pole because there's a keat on top, the killer whale. And we can see there's a little moss growing on the place where there was a dorsal fin. And he's seated on top of this little uh, chief figure and looking out over the harbor toward Shakes Island uh, and on top of a bare pole. So it's, it's that older style. And it's there to mark the territory of one of the clans, of course. And the um, photo on the left is by uh, J.E. Warden, as it says at the bottom. And Warden was around here in uh, uh, 1913, right around in that area. And at that point, it was looking like that, so the whale on top is getting a little more decayed. And one of the phenomena of this horizontal figure thing is, yeah, the horizontal figures rot relatively quickly. But as long as something is there, the lower part has a roof on it. And so even as that whale gets more and more deteriorated and stuff starts growing out of, out of it, this figure has still got paint on it and is still in pretty good shape. And it's an interesting style. We look at it, and there's a pretty large eye. When we see other examples, we'll see that the, the eyelid lines are just wide open like that. There's no recurve in the tips at all. And the carving of the eye socket comes right up to the eyelid line on the bottom. And then it's got a pretty long nose, longer than anybody I know. And it's pretty long nose and a mouth and almost no chin. And, and so that's a style that we're going to investigate. Uh, plus, there's this whale that's in the American Museum of Natural History. And I think there's some association. I think that comes from that house, the house or whatever was uh, the clan that was connected with that pole. And they, they used a, 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 an iron something or other for the bowl of the pipe. And the stem would have probably come in at that dip there in the back. Uh, but everything about and there's got the little ovoid going over the snout. You can just see one end of it. All very stickeen characteristics. And I, I think it was associated with that clan and that pole. And the same with this one, although it, it's a, um, a yai, not a keet. It's a humpback or whatever kind of whale that's not a killer whale. It has a very small fin. And in that case, they put the bull in the blowhole. So when there is smoke coming out of that, I mean, it's just too much clever, you know, it's great. 
So that pole stood there for a long time. And this is up into the 60s when the, the oil business was being established there and the pole was still there, but the, its roof has been gone for a long time. And now the top of the head is gone. The left side, uh, pretty much because it was on the south, right? <laughs> the weather is hitting it. Pretty much weathered away. The one eye, as we can see, is still in pretty decent shape, but you can see how that long nose and then that long cheek area comes right up to the bottom eyelid line. No recurve in the line, wide open eyelids, and uh, that starts to define this person's style. So when they got around to replacing the double whale hat pole, that guy did it. And we can tell by the style of the face, got a long nose, got that big eye with the wide open eyelids. Now, the two whales, they have this neat little sag. They're not straight like that other one. They have this neat little sag to it that somehow just makes it more uh, active, more interesting. And instead of two plain bands, one of them has been carved with the little creature with the face and the body and all that wrapping around to the back of the pole. And, it, and now at that point, I don't know exactly when this was, um, but it was before 1880, so this is probably in the 1870s when that was replaced. Um, the key probably date to the 1860s, that other one we looked at, but uh, so you can see in that other, that 1868 picture is the only one that shows that there were face clearly, that there were faces in the ears of the bear. So when we made a copy of the bear, we based it on that old photograph and so that has the faces in the ears. And now you can see at this point, the Sheikh's house has windows. It had four windows and, uh, well, you can see it here. There's the four windows and a window over the door. And the front's been nicely painted there. So, and then here's this beautiful old chest and there's the current killer whale hat sitting on top of that. Uh, this pole still has paint on it and all that. Still looking pretty decent. The bear's looking worse. And there's these little, little pile of bears down here there's a seated bear, and I know there's another one with it. And we'll see those again. And then you see that hat with that stupendous stack of hat rings on it there that shows up in a lot of the pictures of Atu in the Sheikh's house. So this one is dated. Again, it's J.E. Warden. And this is dated April 8, 1915. And there's the current at that time holder of the title of the Hitsadi of that house. Now, this is in pretty rough shape, even that double will, again, because it's a horizontal thing. And with, you know, there's the holes for the dorsal fin, there's the hole where the hat rings were mortised in, and all those let water down into the thing, as well as the cracks. And so it starts to decay. There's still paint on the vertical part, you see. But then the, the bear is in pretty tough shape. There's that framework on the front of the Sheikh's house on either side of the door, and that was there to uh, support the bear screen when it was outside. So this is clearly a little bit later. There's just the little, the beginnings of little growth there and then by this picture, which must be closer to 1920 or so, and it uh, looks like the snout's about to fall off the bear, it's in such tough shape. And the double whale hat has got a lot of growth in it, but we can still see a little bit of paint in the eyes of that figure. But uh, they, they got probably a little bit worse than that by the time the CCC program came around and they, they made copies of both these. And actually, the, the copy they made of this crouching chief figure here wearing the hat is one of the best copies that came out of that program. They, 
they weren't all spectacular compared to the originals, but the one of this is really very good. And it, particularly that face on the bottom has a really interesting characteristic that we can't really see here, but we'll see later. So this is the one that, that we made, and that, that had only been up there for 25 years. And that's what it looks like. Obviously, it, the one on the right was facing south. And uh, I mean, you walk up and look look at that in the, the building there on, next to the snow. And it, it's amazing how, how tough a shape that's in. And we, we gum pookied all those attachments to try to keep water out of those mortise holes. Uh, maybe with some success, but all the cracks on the snout and all that, that, that that's the kind of toll that the, that the local weather takes on horizontal figures. So this is a copy we made of that keat pole with the characteristics of the carving that we could, you could be pretty confident on based on the old photograph. But, and so this was in, I think, 2013. And it was put up in, what, 88? And uh, so what's that? Barely 25 years. And look how much decay there is on the snout of that whale. And it's probably way, way worse now because that's already nine years ago. But that's just what happens with vertical figures. And that, that era from, like this is a Pillsbury photograph, is labeled at the bottom, 1898. This is described as Lot's house, which was over on Shoestack Point somewhere. And at that time, it's a grand place. I mean, it's got windows up at the top, letting in lights, got a wood stove, got a pipe going up. It's got a framework for drying stuff and to help support the stove pipe. So there's no smoke in there. And there's, you know, these dressers, drawers, rifles. And this guy is wearing a spectacular big spruce root hat with the odd characteristic that it has two stacks of hat rings next to each other, small hat rings, a double stack. And then I've seen a picture of one other woven hat in Wrangell that, that was a little smaller in diameter that also has two stacks of hat rings, the only ones I've ever uh, seen like that. So this very, as they say, tumultuous era between 1898 when this was pic picture was taken and 15 years later this picture was taken. Once the home of a Tlingit chief, it says. So that's a warden picture. And so that that's again around 1913, 1915. Stove still there, the framework, the windows. And then there was this pole. So uh, this is one of those houses along what is now Front Street. So this one was approximately where Curlyville is now. And uh, you can see there's now, not in the original 1868 picture, but now there's milled lumber on the front of these two houses uh, and a hinged door. And this pole standing out in front, and if we look at that figure on the top, we look at those eyes and the way the hollowing comes right up to the eyelid and all that, and it's pretty clearly the same guy's work. Even the nature of the, I mean, there's a lot of pulled up knees with hands on them, but just the particular characteristics of this guy's work are all right there. And uh, killer whale coming over the top, and then this figure with the recurved beak in it, uh, what appears to be a bear, I'm not sure, down at the bottom, and another figure that it's sitting on. And so that was set up right there sometime, don't know when, between 1868, when that other picture was taken, by Mybridge, and, and this photograph, which is probably up closer to 1890-something. And so here's the same house and the one next to it, 
the, that eagle pole that was there in 1868 is still standing at that point. The other pole is showing a lot of weathering, the top figure in particular, which is typical. The house is in pretty rough shape, but it's still there. The house next to it is still there, but the one next to that, just a frame. And then they're starting to be real white man style frame houses bleeding out from the other end of town into this area. So this is still corner of Front Street. And this one is a winter and pond, as it says up in the corner. And they were here, and I think around 1905, something like that. And so that's the condition that was all in at that point. There's the eagle, there's the flying raven. And then the, I, that, I don't think that's the Sheikh's house. I think it's actually, it would be farther over this way, but it might, might be with only two of the four windows and a milled lumber front. And Tiaton, we always hear about Bark House, right? That was a Bark House. Well, that's one right there. And this was listed as being in Wrangell somewhere. I'm not sure where. And I'm not even positive that that attribution was correct. But when I found this photograph, it said that in reference to it. So you can see there's just sheets of cedar bark taken from a probably a pretty small diameter tree. I mean, you know, maybe 18 inches across, something like that. And just neatly peeled that whole strip of bark all the way around the tree and they're being used in place of planks to create that house. I just thought that was interesting. And now, <clears throat> what had been that Flying Raven house is indicated as the oldest house in Wrangell. So the front steps are gone. They don't use that anymore. If, if anybody goes, they're probably using this for the door. And it, it, it's looking like it's not going to last. And then there it is some years later, 18, after 1895 or 6, when the Kiksuddy pole was put in front of the Sun House. So the Sun House stood there for a while by itself before the Kiksuddy pole was carved, and the house was painted up probably at the occasion. And uh, so that and these, we can locate some of these other photographs. Huh? What year was that? Was the the Kick Suddy Pole was carved, I believe, in about 1895, thereabouts. Any? Oh, yeah, not long before. So here's the same place. Uh, the house is gone. A couple of log houses that had been put up are there. The Kick Suddy, the paint's weathered off the sun house, but the pole is still there. That's Now there's a boardwalk there. And so this is probably 1897, maybe even, maybe even a part of 1898. But because of the Klondike gold rush and the number of people that came through town, this is 1898. You can just barely make out the kick study pull back in the background there just a little bit of far away. And so uh, non-native commercial interests have taken over the boardwalk. Um, so there's the big Sheikh's canoe, 50 feet. There's like 25 people in that canoe. It's kind of, it's just amazing. And at the bow of it, it was called the bear canoe, I believe. And so here's this crouching bear holding on to the end block, or those big kind of slightly triangular blocks are added on to the end of the canoes. Because if, if the log was that much bigger, just for that little piece, to carve everything else away is too much trouble. So th that's an added piece. You can see the line of the, s the seam right along there. Even on a small canoe, those are added pieces. But this is one of the big sort of uh, ceremonial canoes. This is probably a Haida made canoe. I don't think even then there were cedar trees in this area big enough to make a canoe that big, 50 feet with no branches. I don't think so. Um, and even back then, I think that was the case. And at the other, so there's the canoe and there's 
somebody was here, I forget who, Partridge, in fact, going around taking pictures with, of that crew in that canoe. So there's a keat pole in the background, there's a little bear, and there you can barely make out there's another bear on the other end. So here's the same canoe in some yard of the Smithsonian back in, I think, the 40s when this picture was taken. And you can see here that there, there was no painting on that canoe on the ends. And so, I don't know, the Smithsonian thought it ought to have the painting. It's not there now. They took that paint off, fortunately, because it's not a terribly accomplished piece of work. And then they, they had this beautiful 53-foot Nuchano-style canoe, spectacular thing. And they hired a Haida guy who knew what he was doing, named Johnny Cadelswa, to paint designs on that. And he at least was a good painter, good designer, you know. So I don't know, that might still have that painting on it, but not there. But here's the little bear that was at the stern sitting up. And here's a little bit closer picture of it. And we can look at that. There's that same eye we've been looking at. The hollow goes right to the bottom eyelid. Little faces in the ears. It just ha has some of the characteristics of that guy's work. And this, this is a good drawing of the other bear. And it's obviously not the same carver. Eyelid shape is different. The hollowing, the deepest part of the hollow is below the eye completely. And uh, it's just another person's work. Now, I don't know who that might have been, but uh, this person who did this seems to have occasionally worked with somebody else. So that little bear and the other one too still survives. This is in the Smithsonian. I don't know why there's paint slapped all over it, but we can see the little faces in the ears and all the characteristics of that. And there's the end block of the canoe that it was attached to. And the canoe itself is in the Smithsonian too. Yeah, I think it had, they cut it in half in the middle whoosh, to fit it on a rail car to get it to DC. But, and it's not on display. It's in a little storage building. And the only time I was there 30 years ago, you couldn't get into that building because the roof had been damaged in a storm. They wouldn't let you in. So I didn't get to see that in person. So here's a couple of the little things. This is in the De Young Museum in San Francisco. And um, it's clearly a representation of that one-legged fisherman story. There's the ropes and the salmon holding on. But if we look at that face, those eyes, those eyes, <laughs> and, and look at the top. Now, this, this was a characteristic that was present in some of those other pictures we looked at, but you couldn't see the detail well enough to, de to detect it. But you can see. The eye like has, it's like there's a little eyelid there, fleshy eyelid that, you know, is on about just above the eye. Really neat little characteristic. And, and that part of that is about this tall. I've seen it in the de Young. And the staff that it's on makes the whole thing about this tall, something like. And it was said to be a fish trap marker, so that it was a clan identity for a fish trap location. And the one in the middle is a, uh, a fish club, halibut club, probably you would. It's about club length, about that long. Um, came up at auction somewhere, and a, a collector I know pretty well in Seattle bought it. And there's our same eye, everything about it, a little just rounded nose, one little U shape. And that's that. And then this model pole is, I think, in the Burke. And it's got enough characteristics that made me think it might have been that same guy, although I'm less certain of it. But his pièce de résistance, as they say, was this one. And this was in front of a grave house, an elaborate grave house, over at the tip of Schustak Point somewhere. And it shows. Uh, a, a shaman or a clan leader with a bird hat with a rope torturing this witch on the bottom. And um, 
a great little carving. And at some point, maybe when somebody demanded that property or whatever, it was moved over in front of a new Flying Raven house that stood about where Curlyville or the Brig Bar is now. And it was up on pilings. And you can tell the house is brand or pretty brand new at that point. You can see the rust from the nails into the framing of the siding. But now suddenly there's, there's that's the same pole and it was called the beaver pole because that's a beaver up at the top. But suddenly it's got more carving. How do you do that? So there it is, and this helps to locate it because that's the original location of the raven pole back there, the Sheikh's raven pole, which was in front of the, is it a Baptist church right there on the corner of where Case Avenue comes around, Church Street goes up. Anyways, that was there. There was this other terrific house front thing over here set back, and it, looked like this, though it's a little uh, shark or dogfish man. And I'm not sure who painted it, but it might have been our same guy. But the reason that suddenly got all those other figures was because they're just bolted onto the front, which seems like an odd way to do things, except that this is that section. So that's in the old style house that was there before the new frame house was built. And it goes right up to the ceiling. Got a guy holding a carved staff and there's a tentipus, tentipus, tentacle of an octopus. <laughs> it's fun being nervous, right? <laughs> anyway, so there's that section and that's what came out of this house. There's the special room at the back of the house and they went to the trouble of staggering the boards so it made a design across the top. I thought that was cool. Great old chest sitting on the benches over there the, the surrounding the house wooden floor but so that section uh, was just spiked onto the rest of the pole at some point and then I think as far back as the 40s the State Museum acquired that pole and the old State Museum building. There, that was in that stairwell that went up to the second floor. So they've taken that one piece that was separate and cut it off at the top of this guy's head and he's clearly holding a sea lion, splitting it in half. And there's the bottom part of the pole. And so th that bare shaft that went up to the beaver stopped, you know, started right here went on up so he's wearing this what I think is a bird on top of his head and there's the rope around this other figure's neck and all that and here's the guy holding a staff of a long beaked bird maybe a raven and the tentacles no, <laughs> tentacle and that 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 tentacle just lays on his cheek it's really great and this this face here on this guy is really something else. I mean, it looks like you blow him up with uh, like a balloon. <laughs> but he's got those big long, long nose again. There's the same eye. And there's that same little fleshy tuck at the top. A real, real neat little uh, naturalistic uh, characteristic that he put in. There's a fair amount of weathering on it because it stood outside for a long time. And interesting to note the little sea lion that, that's on the chest of this guy, it was a separate piece because down, down in that hole it would have been really hard to carve that the way, any other way, and so it's nailed in. But curiously, uh, here, the tail is down and the head is up. You see the, the, the tail right here. And when they put it up in the State Museum, they got it backwards. Oops, I went too far the other way. They put it, got it backwards and now the tail is up and the head is down. You can see the, the spike holes where it's fastened on. And then um, I think this mask has that guy's characteristics in, in many ways. Hollow goes right to the lower eyelid and so on. <clears throat> Little kind of round bulby nose. 
this other mask, which I think is in the Met. I'm not sure where this one is anymore. And uh, this might be the same guy's work. Uh, it's harder to tell. But here's a close-up of that guy. So you can see how the tentacle is just sort of laid on his cheek. And, I mean, this, this, and there it is again. It's just so perfect, you know, this great thing. But the hat is already, you know, it's pretty well gone. There's a galvanized band to hold the top of the head together. So that's the way it is now in the new museum. It's kept in the storage probably. Be, when I went there for the first time, I, I wondered why don't they have, that's one of the greatest things in the museum. Why isn't it on display? But I think it's because of condition issues. I mean, you can see just sitting there, stuff's falling off of it. So I guess they chose not to put it on display. So this, I think, I think might be another Pillsbury photograph, uh, probably around 1898. They've got a stove and a stovepipe too. This is a Cochetti house over like where Svenson's shop is, somewhere like that. And it's got milled lumber and uh, traditional framework and two, the two house posts, uh, which still survive, of course. And here's that uh, odd thing about two different carvers again. So the one on the left, of which this is a better picture, shows clearly that same guy's work hollowed right up to the bottom of the eyelid, wide open eyes, no recurve, and the, the big frog there. And the other one, totally different. You can tell that's a totally different carver. Once you get used to look at the the frog's eyes, here it's the same story, you know. But over here there's a tremendous pinch in the eyelids, the same on the face. So there was somebody that worked alongside this guy from time to time. I think he made this hat. Uh, there's the eye we've been looking at. And he was a great sculptor, but apparently he wasn't the best with flat design. And so where some other artists would have, you know, gone farther with the form line tradition to fill a hat like that, um, he, he filled it as best he thought he could. But it, it's not a classic northern form lines. I think he made this hat just going by the sculpture and the fact that there's not a lot of real flat design on it, form lines anyway, but the same sculpture in the head and this one, uh, which was in the Portland Art Museum, I think. Which one of these got repatriated in one of them? Not sure. Huh? Ah, great thing. And now, I think just based on what we can see down here, it was the same person's work. And certainly this sort of fits that bill. The ta tail, excuse me, the tail of the dogfish on the back and then this doesn't have the big open eyes, but it does have long, unpinched eyelids and uh, hollowing right to the bottom eyelid. There's another view of it, great hat. And this little face is clearly the same guy's work. Long nose, same eye we've been looking at, same hollow, uh, small mouth, almost no chin. And this little face is about mm, yay high on the end of a nine foot ceremonial bow, like bow and arrow bow. There's a face like this at each end. Um, and there was a few of those around, that kind of large ceremonial bow. But that's clearly the same guy's work. And the question of the century is, is that him? And that little house post he's working on ended up in a traditional house um, somewhere in the neighborhood of the Kadashan area. And uh, somewhere I have a photograph of the inside of that house. And you can see that house post standing in it. So somebody got this guy in, I'm sure he carves in his regalia, you know. But somebody posed this picture and he's holding the knife. So, it may, the guy may not have actually been working on it, although there's, you know, it was under construction. There's chips all over the 
all over the place. But maybe that was him. And uh, Emmons commented about uh, the carver Tayat, which we heard more about earlier today. And um, he said he carved most of the poles standing in Wrangell. So we just looked at most of the poles standing in Wrangell and, at that time. And, and they were one person's work. Not all of them, but the, the most of them were. And um, so that's a big mystery, Tao Yat. Now we know that um, Tao Yat was killed. <laughs> Too emotional. In 1880, in an altercation with some uh, Hootsnoos from Angoon over a, a liquor distillery they had going down by the fort. And um, I, I can't think of the name of the, the missionary that was prominent here at that time. His name has been escaping me. I know it, but my search function is slowing down. At any rate, um, the missionary, he knew that Dawiyat was a Goa Khan peacemaker and so he went and gets him he said come on you got to come with us we got to get you know there's a fight starting over the still and all that with the Indian policemen and the Hootsnoos so they went down there to quell the disturbance and one of the Hootsnoos shot him in the forehead so all that work that we looked at was definitely done before 1880. Now, I, I don't know who carved this mask, but if there ever was a portrait mask, that's it. I mean, look at that. I mean, it's got really naturalistic eyes and all the fleshy characteristics of the face and the ear and the whole business. I mean, that looks like a real person. And this came from a grave house on a little island in Zimovia Street. And it's in the Rhode Island School of Design now. Odd place for it, but there it is. And I just couldn't resist showing it. Then, um, this pole, which we looked at briefly, and which there are fragments of laying on the beach scene in the museum here, from about, this face isn't there, and the bear at the bottom isn't there, but the whale and this guy tearing the whale in half are, are there, the original parts, here in the museum, and a copy of it stands on the island. Not the best copy on the island, but it's good good copy but the original is really something else and so here's this this guy and he's clearly tearing that whale in half and there's another figure in front so where's his feet his feet are on the back that's the f and here's the elbows of this figure here oh, I'm pointing on the screen here. Kassan, amongst all those Haida poles and that old Tlingit one, was a, another pole that was contemporary with the other Haida poles. But I always wondered, because it's really in Tlingit style, it doesn't look like a Haida pole at all. 
a big tall pole, at least 30 feet, and it's back in the kind of the back row of houses. I always wondered about it. And the one time I've been in Kassan on the ground, uh, looking around at things with uh, Stony Hamar, Stormy Hamar, and uh, I wanted to see that pole, but it had been kind of reworked by the CCC people, and it wasn't in original condition anymore. But uh, that, that was a, a great, great thing. Oh, so what I'm talking about is that pole at the back of Old Kassan, the Tlingit style one. And Viola Garfield's notes stated that it was carved by a, a Tlingit carver from cake. So some Haida person, clan leader, commissioned a Haida from, I mean a Tlingit from cake to carve the pole for that I had a village. So that kind of thing happened, you know, carvers from elsewhere being brought in. And then this guy, we know the most about him. It's a Pillsbury photograph, so it's around 1898. You can barely see the title down there, but it says, Ucas the Carver. So this is William Ucas, Tom Ucas's father, and a beautiful staff that he was carving at the time. Got his Winchester 1873 over here in what might be a Savage 99. And model house, hand saw. This, this is a workshop that was right like where the boat yard is, where the road forks to go out to Shakes Island. It was right in that area somewhere. And uh, according to Marge Bird. And um, so there he is sitting in his workshop. And we know that he was recognized by modern clan people as having carved the Kiksuddy pole. And you can see even in that work a certain amount of similarity to that pole. But he carved quite a few things. This is out at um, what's often called Cemetery Point. And these were facing the water. Uh, there's a frog there at the top of the bear pole and what appears to be a, a shaman woman, there's a librette in her lip and all these little otters on her chest and coming over her shoulders and on her head. She's got the little ears and um, really looks to me like Yika'a's style. So, William Ucas's Slingit name was Yikas. And so here's the, that pole when it was moved to Front Street, when there was boardwalks everywhere, and painted up a little bit, but there it is. Here it's in front of the Bear Totem store sometime before 1952. And interestingly, this whale is now in the Burke. These two little bears are in the LA County Museum. And this is nowhere that I know of disappeared. Might have gotten so badly damaged in the 1952 fire that it was trashed, I don't know. But if, if that one didn't survive, why did the bears survive? And maybe they left just in time, I don't know. And the frog down there was the other one that came in from Cemetery Point. So for a time, they were standing there on Front Street. And of course, we know this as the Kiksadi Pole. Um, and this is William Ucas' work, uh, Kachtin, it's often called, Kachtin's Pole. And there it is in front of the Sun House, when the Sun House was freshly painted and all that. And so now, the copy of it is standing on that exact spot right in the same hole that that pole was in. So that's where we put it. And even that one has a certain amount of bare pole, undecorated pole at the bottom, a real old style, that old style characteristic. So it's a great thing. And there's a somewhat later picture of it. The sun house was still standing in the, that time. And that's clearly been repainted enough times that it's still surviving. So stylistically, we see the same kind of work 
here. Now, where have we seen this before? There's a bird with a corona around it, the wings opened out, a figure on its chest, and a little raven with its wings folded and its feet. And then, the, so it was that pole at Old Town. And the top figure is sitting on a box with its knees pulled up. And all we saw in that other picture of Old Town was the box and the knees. And the whole rest of it had rotted away. And there was not, this figure on the bottom wasn't there at the time. So uh, the Ikaas carved this pole and he used those figures because they were appropriate for that family. So this was for um, Shakes' wife's side. And here this is listed as raising the raven pole, February 1896. And that, that's the house of George Shakes, I think at the time, I'm not positive about that. And so they were just bringing it up there to put it up. So this is the part that went into the ground and you can see it's got a big bark seam and whatnot. And I think the, the, that particular log might have had some ongoing decay in it when it was carved. And I know I've worked on some, well, one of the poles that Nathan Jackson and I carved that were in front of the uh, uh, Centennial Building in Juneau. They're now in different places. One of them's in the uh, school, and uh, I'm not sure if they could found a place for the other one or not, indoors, because they were getting weathered enough that if they were gonna survive, they had to come indoors. And one of those, the log up at the top, it had fung, even though the wood looked solid, felt, sounded solid, it had like a fungus all the way through it. And if you adzed on it, this fungus would stick to the blade of your ads and it was really hard to get off. You'd have to use a solvent to get it off. You'd and carve a little bit more and then you'd have to, it was a real pain in the rear. But I think that was partly the case with this because when you look at the fragments of it in a pile outside the, uh, I don't know what you call the building there on Front Street now, next to the snow or the pole. Called the what? Carving center. Carving center. Outside of that are the pieces of this pole. And you can tell that that was really de badly decayed from the inside. In fact, the first time I came here in 1978, that pole had, within the two weeks before that, blown down in a storm, broke off and fell down. But so that was, and if it was put up in 1896, it, you know, it had been there for 70 something years, uh, 82 years, but some poles last better longer than that. But I think it was because the log itself had uh, fungus in it and so it, it didn't survive as well as it could have. So uh, interesting parts of uh, Yikaas's style so here's the, the original when it was more in one piece and the copy we made of it. But you can see um, this interesting style of eyelid where the top is a long gentle curve and the bottom has a real marked bend on both ends, see? And it's a very deeply carved in what you'd call the whites of the eyes and it's that way on the original. And not all the faces on that pole are that way, but the beaver's eye is that way, and this one is sort of that way. That's a real characteristic of his style, and it's deeply carved. The hollowing of the eye socket stops at the eyelid line here, but it continues under that eyelid line on each end. You can see that here better than here, but it shows up pretty good down here with the shadow. So that's a characteristic of his style. And uh, this very simple U-shape and, and so on um, that, that made up his style, a really great work. And this is uh, the Shakes killer whale canoe. He had two, he had the bear canoe and this one. And this was about 44 feet long. 
And I, the reason I don't think he cast made the canoe. I think that might be that bow that had the faces on it right there, being held by this guy. There's there's twenty something, close to twenty people in this canoe. And they're sitting three across on some of the thwarts. And there's great paintings that Yikos did, I believe, based on the style of the painting. So if you look at the head of that whale, got the ovoid, and then the snout is a, a, a broad ovoid with a pretty well filled by the inner ovoid and the secondary area between. And if we go back to this bowl and we look at, there's pretty much that same set of elements right here. So I think that painting style matches up with what's on that canoe. And um, there it is in the canoe shed that was right next to the Sheikh's house, which is great. It was protected in there. You can see the size of the end blocks on that. So they run from here to here, separate piece added on. Great thing. And then when um, that particular Sheikh passed away, his widow Mary Sheikh sold the collection that was there. And there was more than just Nanya Ayi stuff. Uh, the Kachadi hat was in that group and some others, other things from other groups. And um, she sold, there was bought jointly, all that collection was bought jointly by the Burke Museum and the Denver Art Museum. And so that's why we see things from here in both those museums. The bare screen is in the Denver Art Museum uh, and other stuff from here is in the Burke. So preparatory to that, this is down on the dock, uh, somewhere along the waterfront there, waiting to be shipped out. And, and this was 1952. And that whole side of the waterfront burned up, including that. And I talked to somebody, I forget who it was, who was here at the time. And he and a friend said they were, they were getting ready, they were gonna shove the canoe out into the water, try to save it. But then somebody else came, come on you guys, we need you down here. They ran off and when they came back it was too late. So this uh, sun mask shows up in some of the old pictures of Atu in the Sheikh's house. And I'm, I'm certain this is a Yika'as piece of work based on the flat design and the sculpture of the face. I think he made that sun mask. And I think this is the version of the one-legged fisherman that used to be out at the tip of Cemetery Point. And I think he did the sculpture on that, the face at the top, which is in the museum, and this face, and there's the ropes and the fish. But the flat design here and on the wings and, and down here on these fish isn't really up to his traditional style of work. But there we can see that same eyelid characteristic, the long curve of the top and the double curve of the bottom and the deep hollowing underneath. So it's distinct, the sculpture is distinctly his work, but it's possible that his son Tom did the painting. And he, 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 he's a great guy, I'm sure, and he's got a beautiful ad there in his hand. But I don't think he had the knowledge of the traditional two-dimensional design that his father had, i just put it that way. So here's Yikos Flying Raven that was also out at the point, cemetery point. And when I first came here, that the, the vertical part of that, which is just an adzed pole, was still standing up. But, but the, uh, the Flying Raven was gone. But I'm pretty sure he, he did that. Here it is somewhat later, starting to decay. And, and so that part just plain uh, rotted away and fell off. But Again, it protected the vertical part for a long time. And because there's no exposed end grain, just, just the exterior of the log carved down with an adze, that survived really pretty well and was still standing 
1978. And then this pole was down there at the cemetery point as well. And again here, I think that Yikaas carved this, the sculpture of this. So there's a dogfish with the head turned up this way and a couple of dorsal fins, and then the tail was an added on piece, and it's off to the side, really pretty clever composition. And this is good solid old sculpture with the hat with the figure on the top. But that, that that's a sort of less accomplished two dimensional design there, and on the box as well. And so maybe uh, Tom painted and his father carved those pieces. And here that is on a dock downtown. And uh, it, it left probably before 1952. These two nice canoes were there as well. This one might be, there's a canoe in the Washington State History Museum in Tacoma. And it's about that long and it's very narrow like that is. I mean, you can see those ribs coming down. That's not a real broad bottom canoe. And there's one just like that with ribs in it and everything, painted up fresh, you know, in the wash or outside the Washington State History Museum. And so there's that pole laying there. The, the lower bear or wolf, whichever that is, is still there. The tail of the dogfish is missing. And the last time I saw that, it was at the old, the storage of the old Museum of the American Indian, which the brook a brick building separate from the museum building itself over next to a highway in the Bronx. And uh, so that was the storage. And you could go in there and everything from the Museum of the American Indian that wasn't on display was in that storage building. And I went out and back and there was kind of a, a tent shed sort of a thing. And that pole was laying in that shed in roughly that condition, hadn't changed very much. So there it is somewhere in the Mu Museum of the American Indian. And this is telling me end of show. So th if, thank you very much. Can I ask you a question? Yes, indeed. <laughs> Thanks for coming. And so many people stayed. I'm not, I'm, it's great. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, there was a story, it showed canes and then poles. So it might, oh. there might have been Museum of the American Indian. Do they have to make a, a publication? I don't know about the publication. They've got the staff. It's about yay high. Oh, okay, yeah. And there's a picture, there's one picture I don't have it, um, of the front of the Sheikh's house, a little, uh, little porchy like thing. And there's about four young boys. Uh, standing out there, and one's holding the sheikh's hat, one's holding that staff, and they're all they're all posed there for some reason. But that so that shows the staff there, and it's it's in the New York uh, location of the Museum of the American Indian, the old Customs House, bottom of Manhattan Island. Any other questions? Yeah. The carver from here who carved the houseboats, and I'm not any houseboats, was Kiksuggy. He carved, I know he carved here for our offices. It sounds like they took him to uh, Klukwan and he carved for uh, Kanakadis. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah I know they're right. Yeah, interesting. But apparently, they, they wanted him and they didn't care. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I'm asking. So yeah. nice to know. I, mean, I don't know, but that seems to be the case. Because you're right, those are two Raven clans. Instead of opposite sides, yeah, yeah. Have well, you ever heard of the Eden Shaws as Carver from Haida, Hyper? Uh, uh, well, yeah, I know, I know Robert and Reg and. Uh, well, because of those Kadashan totems, that somebody mentioned that might be their style. That it would have been oh, Charles Eden, them. the Charles Eden Shaw. Yeah. Um, That, those were up in 1868. I don't think he was alive in 1868. 
he died in 1920. And um, he, he might have been born around 1868. So I, I don't think he, he, and he wasn't a carver at that time. So I don't think he did it, but it was some other uh, Haida Carver. There are a lot of Haida Carvers back then. I mean, not just that family. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious with the, uh, with the spruce root greens, is there a way we can, is there like a relationship between the wood of all the toes and then the carver? Like, a, like you know, somebody carved a hat, you know, would there have been a relationship between the carver and then the woman who wove the reeds that would go on the hat all the time? Well, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to it. Um, there may have been weavers who specialized in making those. They're called skills in Haida, hat rings. And, uh, you know, they all, they come out around a wooden, uh, it's not a disc, it's just like a perimeter of wood to, to weave around. So the weaving starts, comes up the sides in that beautiful three-strand twining. And if you look at like the the rings on the Kachadi frog hat, oh my God! I mean, the, the, they are so tiny. The weaving you can't believe that you could split spruce roots that small, that long, and weave them that beautifully. I mean, it's just incredible. I mean, I don't know how many rows there are in a ring that wide, but it's like more than twelve way finer than a lot of the others. So they, they come up and in and back out again and up the next ring and in and back out again and up the next ring and in back out. Some, and some people call them potlatch rings and imply that you add on another ring every time you have a potlatch. Well, you'd have to recarve the whole set because they're not separate pieces. And you see pictures of old hats with rings on them over decades of time in some cases, and they don't change. The number of rings don't change. And they, like all the hats from Angoon have three rings, that's it. They just have three rings, that's the way it is. So that whole ring, potlatch ring theory doesn't apply. So it, it's probably a measurement of something else. Maybe how many times that object has been reproduced through generations of time. That's a possibility. There's other possibilities, of course, but um, they represent something in terms of status, but the what exactly is hard to say. I don't know the answer to what exactly. So I, I've come to call them status rings other than, instead of pilot rings. Any other question? Well, thanks again so much for coming and being such a great audience. And thanks to the gentleman whose computer this is, who saved the whole story. <laughs>